Now I'm gonna give you a history here on this Hemi engine and the Chrysler products. What happened is, is in 1964, they had what was called a 426 wedge. And the reason why the engine displacements were in that 420 range is because they didn't want the engines being any larger than seven liters. So that's why Chevy had a 427, Ford had a 427, you know, Pontiac had a 421, Chrysler had a 426, Ford went to a 429, and a couple of years later, 428, they were all in that range, so it met the requirements for NASCAR. Mm -hmm. So Chrysler had a 426 wedge head, meaning two valves side by side, small valve cover. They went to Daytona with these five cars, and they had the wedge head engine in them. They went and did all their time trials for the whole week with the wedge engine. On Saturday night, Chrysler finished dyno tuning their engines that they were going to send down to Daytona, Florida, right? Saturday night, the crews pulled out the wedges, put in the Hemis, and nobody knew anything about it. Well, they didn't cheat. It still was a Chrysler engine, it still was the same displacement. It's just they went ahead and dropped those engines in. And they didn't do it purposely. They did it simply because of the fact they were rushing so much to get this engine into development. They went from no engine to having it in the car in four months. Mm -hmm. So they completely had to develop this engine in that short amount of time. So they were using every moment to dyno tune them and get them right. So they popped these engines into that car, in those five cars, and they cleaned house. The thing looked everything out there. And the reason for this is, is it's because the way the valve train is on this. Those intake and exhaust valves are cantered way over like this. When that air charge come in, comes in, it doesn't have to make a hard turn to go into the chamber. It just goes flowing straight in. You can grab this head without any valves in it. You can look through the intake port and you can see straight out the exhaust port. So how is that as far as moving air through an engine? That's why this engine was so strong. It had such a high end breathing capacity. This is a big block engine. And this engine, on my cars, I have done this myself personally. I have three Hemi cars, and I have taken all three at 8,000 RPM. Wow. A big block, 8,000 RPM. If you were to do that to a big block Chevrolet, it would be parts all over the ground. <laughs> so this engine was purposely built for racing. What ended up happening is, is, for that year of 1964, Chrysler cleaned everybody off the table. They won about every race they went to. Ford got very upset. They were human mad. They protest NASCAR Trigger. stating that this is illegal. That car is a purpose built, or that engine is a purpose built engine. They don't have them in their street cars. So NASCAR came to and said, yeah, you're right. So in 65, NASCAR banded the Hemi engines. And Chevrolet at that time was coming out with their mystery engine, which ended up being like a 427, you know, 396. That had some cantered valves. And for 1965, Chevy as a product and Chrysler as a product was at NASCAR racing. So NASCAR took a big hit. What Chrysler did is they thought, you know what? We'll show you. So in 1966, they started putting these race engines in streetcars. So the bottom line here is, is I have to thank Ford for being such a pain in the neck. Because what did they do? Without them doing that, these probably would have never existed in a streetcar because this was a very expensive engine to build and it was a high cost. You gotta keep in mind, back in that timeline for you to get this engine in a car was an extra $900 on a car that's base price for $2,700. So it's like a third of the price of the car to get this engine up for So how much for that in uh, today's money? Right. In today's money, yeah. to buy one of these engines, yeah. they're about $20,000. Wow. Just the engine. Shoot. Yeah. So what ended up happening here is, is then Chrysler had them in the street cars, and then they went racing in 66. But this is where it gets a little bit sort of sweet. What I mean is, is what comes around, what or goes around, comes around, right? What happened is, is Ford was working on their 427 single overhead cam semi Hemi. They decided in 66, they were gonna bring it to NASCAR. They brought it to NASCAR, and NASCAR looked at that, saw that twin, saw that single cam, saw that Hemi head, they go, what street car do you have to do? And they said, no way. 
<laughs> so that car, that engine never ran in NASCAR. Never did. It was banned because Ford did not want to produce that expensive engine for the street cars. So that's how that all came to be. But what happened is Richard Petty fell in love with these engines. He was driving the 64 cars, 65 cars, and he was winning big time. He's well over 200 races he's won. He is really the king of NASCAR. And this particular year was the year Excuse that me. came out with the Superbird. That's the one that has the big beat, and it has that big wing on the back. It's all based on this car. So this truly is a downgrade of the future. And they put a lot of research in that car, and not a lot of car cars. What they did on that is they said no more aero cars. Because the aero cars are not going to be aero cars. They decided to let the engine stay in place in section one. And you know what? It was still Excuse winning me. races. So it has a lot of race history. But there's another slice of race history with this engine. This engine, in an aluminum form, is still running top fuel drag strips. This is the engine that makes, not in this cast iron version, in drag race version, this engine is the one that makes 11,000 horsepower. Wow. It's a lot. 11,000 horsepower. 11,000, man. Yes. Shoot. Pretty darn cool. I can grab a crankshaft. I can grab connecting rods. I can grab push rods. I can grab internal parts and it bolts right into this engine. That's how amazing this engine is. The modern Hemi, Hemi engine, <clears throat> have you seen the valve covers on them? They're only about this big and about that long. What do you see with these valve covers? They're pretty big. It looks like an oil pan, doesn't it? Yeah. That's because the valves are really tilted. A modern Hemi is really not a Hemi. Mm. It really isn't. You see the bottom of that cylinder head, those valves aren't cantered. It doesn't have a hemispherical dome. It's just a little bit of a bump. Oh. You know what I mean? They're using their past to help sell the car. Saying oh. Hemi power, Hemi power. It's not really a full Hemi engine. What's cool about this thing is, is it's got two four barrel carburetors. Comes with a, what in its time was an awesome distributor. It's a Presto Light dual point distributor. It has two points and a very fast advance curve on it. And again, this has got cross bolted mains. It's got four bolts that go up and two bolts to go side. So every main on this thing is supported by six bolts. And that's why this thing can spin such an RPM. A very cool history. Drag racing, stock car racing. This went into uh, uh, dragster, boat dragsters. I mean, it went all over the place. And again, it is still being used. So a very famous engine. What ended up happening is in 1971, all the EPA rules were changing, and they cut production of all the Hemi engines. Oh. So the last year for these engines to be sold in this configuration was 1971. This car here happens to be a 1970, and of this year make and model, meaning a 1970 Roadrunner, hardtop, Hemi, four speed, they only made 58 of them. That's very small. That's very small. But what makes it smaller is this has another option that makes it smaller. This one happens to be a drag race package. It's got a 410 Dana 60 rear end in the back end. A 410 car, they only made 25 of them. 25 410 four speed Hemi hardtop road runners. So this was one of 25 when this was in circulation. But if you think about the 58, that's barely one car per state. You know what I mean? So super rare cars, and they are a kick to drive. They drive so smooth, and when you get on the throttle, it turns into just nothing but a, an animal. This is like a Jekyll and Hyde. You know what I mean? But I do love it, and I do love the process of building it. What I want to express to you, and this is what I want you to listen to, I know the grinding's going on. This is all from love and passion. For me to do everything on these cars, it did not come easy. You had to put, you have to put yourself into it. 
you have to have that fire in your chest. You got to have that, I am going to conquer this. You have to have that hunger, that thirst. And absolutely everything you see on this car was all done with these two hands. The vinyl top, the upholstery, the stainless steel, the straightening of the stainless steel, the polishing, the engine, the transmission, the building, the water pump, the power steering, the alternator, the starter, every single part did not leave my garage. I did everything. Body work, paint, I mean all of it. The only thing I couldn't do is what? <clears throat> chrome the bumpers. Mm. You have to have chrome tanks to do that. I'm not spending that much money. I just got the bumpers chrome. <laughs> So I have no responsibility on the bumpers. That's not me. How much is for those? Um... They're expensive now. It could be a thousand dollars to chrome a bumper now. Mm. It used to be like eighty bucks. Well, dang. Yeah, but the point I'm getting at here is, is I want to express this to you. You, you all are not any different than me. All you have to do is light that fuse. You know what I mean? If that's what you want, that's what you need to conquer. Just don't take no for an answer. What I did through my life is I dove into something on a car and I wanted to get as much as I can out of it. I wanted to know it, know it, know it. The moment I felt good, what did I do? I went to another process, another process, another process. And after basically about five years, I had it all done. Doing body work is the worst thing. I love doing the sheet metal work, but when it comes to doing the body work, I don't like it, but I still do it. And the reason why I do it is, is for one, it's super expensive to get it done right. And the other thing is, is chances are you're not going to get it done right. Mm. You know what I mean? So that's why I continue to do it on my cars only. But I did go through a period of time where I did salvage cars, and that I did on purpose because I really wanted to know how to do the metal work and how to straighten cars out. Then I went into restoration, and I did that for about 10 years, and I had a good time doing it, except I didn't have a good time with the customers. Oh. The customers drove me crazy. When I was doing the salvage cars, if I had one that I bought for somebody, they had an order for me and I bought the car, they didn't bother me. All they said is, when the car's done, call me. That's all. When I started doing the restoration, they wanted to show up every three days. You know what I mean? Get out of the shop. I don't want you here. They bring friends. They bring beer. When can I drink beer? Get out of here. So, the point I'm getting at though is you could do this. What do you need? Passion. You gotta have it. If you have somebody that says, oh yeah, I'll get to it, or yeah, I'd like to, or someday, what does that say right there? Most likely they're not gonna it's go. It's already defeat. They're admitting right there in their words that they choose, it ain't going to happen. You know what I mean? Mm. And that's something I never said. When I got onto a new project, I figured it out. I found information. I went and talked to some professionals and got some tips. You know? Convertible tops, vinyl tops, doing sewing. I had my own sewing machine. I mean, everything I did. And it is it's still a fire in me. I have more cars, I have four more that need to be restored, and I can't wait to get rolling on them. 